Valley, so he's been very, very busy. Um, Will has worked in public health for 30 years. He received a Bachelor of Science in Marketing from North Northern Arizona University, a Bachelor of Science in Microbiology from Arizona State University, and a Master's in Public Health from the University of California, Berkeley. He was awarded an honorary doctorate from the University of Arizona in 2015 for his career commitment to engaging partnerships between academic and executive public health. He worked at ADHS for 23 years. Six of those years he served as the agency's director. Currently, he's the executive director for the Arizona Public Health Association and is an adjunct faculty member with the U of A's Mel and Enid, Enid, is that how they say that? Zuckerman College of Public Health. He also served as a health policy director at the University of Arizona from 2015 to 2017. From my perspective, Will is a great example of a humanist. Not only is he passionate about ensuring the public's health, he has a strong belief in evidence-based practices and he was a very compassionate leader at the state health department. Um, I remember especially when the economy started getting bad in around 2008, 2009, he actually pulled a bunch of us in his office to kind of prepare us. I don't know if you remember this, maybe I was imagining it, but to, just to get our input as to what the next steps would be when, when things eventually did crash. Um, he um, became the director in 2009, and um, it, he must have been slammed. I, I think it was really a, a tough time for him. There was a lot of resentment, a lot of blame, and about all the cuts and furloughs and, and issues that came up, but he handled it so wonderfully. He kept us updated. He kept um, sending us messages about the status of things, and he was really concerned about us as individuals. So. I appreciated that. Um, anyway, so I want him to start, and so because I know you're going to have a lot of questions, and um, I can introduce to you now. Please help me welcome Will. Humble. Thanks, Roxanne. <laughs> that was really nice, Roxanne. <laughs> and thank you for the invitation. Does this sound okay? Yeah. Okay. I better stand far. Where's the speaker? Because sometimes if you stand too close to the speaker, it sounds weird. Is, is this okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, so thanks for the invitation. I thought what I'd do is do a couple of different things. Um, number one, I, I, I thought I'd start off with the difference between health care and public health. Because it's, it's not something that you often hear in um, the news, the difference between those two. And I want to focus on why public health is so important in terms of um, improving quality of life and life expectancy. Not to, not to put down health care, but just to reinforce the importance of investing um, public dollars into public health. Um, and then I thought what we would do is go over some of the public health bills that are active right down uh, at the legislature right now. Um, so I'm the lobbyist for our organization, and uh, so I'm down at the Capitol a lot. Uh, one of the things I thought we could have sort of a discussion about um, towards the end is uh, vaccines, the importance of vaccination, um, why it's important to have herd immunity and who herd immunity protects, and then some of the challenges that we're facing right now down at the legislature with efforts to um, undo or put forward public policy that will actually drive down immunization rates and um, uh, uh, put special needs folks, uh, young kids, et cetera, at risk. So, uh, so we got a lot to cover, uh, but I'd like this to be an interactive discussion. So if you have questions, just uh, shout them out and I'll see what I can do as we go forward. So, um, so what's the difference between healthcare and public health? I guess what I would start with is that with healthcare, it's, it's a physician or a, a clinician patient relationship. Well, first of all, I have to tell you something. I just bit my tongue at breakfast, <laughs> like really bad. So if, it, if I sound a little odd, I have a weird flap on my tongue. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, it doesn't hurt. It just feels weird. Um, 
So, uh, so in, when it comes to healthcare, it's a, it's a clinician-patient relationship. And so the dynamic happens where the patient is the patient for the clinician, right? Well, in public health, we think of the community as the patient. So it's not about, it, it's not about an individual person. It's about enacting public health policies that help keep the community healthier. And vaccines is a really good ex example of that. But I thought what I'd do is highlight some of the public health interventions over the last 100 years that have made such a dramatic improvement in quality of life and life expectancy um, in the US. So if you go back 100 years to, say, uh, uh, 1919, life expectancy in the US was about 50 years old. Now, a lot of people, of course, 50, but child mortality was really bad back in 1919, and that's from a lot of different factors, most of which were related to infectious diseases, but not everything. That were bad public health outcomes to lower life days were things like uh, poor housing, crowded housing, and especially uh, you know cities with tenement type housing. Um, poor uh, workplace safety, um, accidents and injuries related to, to, uh, to, to cars, motor vehicles, and so forth. So a lot of those things combined to keep life expectancy down around 50 um, years old if you go back 100 years. Well, press ahead to where we are today in 2019. I think you 100 laymen in the street why life expectancy is now in the mid-70s and, and how that's 20 longer than, than it was 100 years ago, I think most people would probably say it's medical technology, better medication, um, uh, cancer treatment, that kind of stuff. Because that's, that's what you would mostly see on the news as an explanation for why people are living longer. But in fact, that has a marginal difference. Um, and, I'm, and medical technology, CAT scans, all that stuff has its role but if you look at it collectively and try to figure out what's the real reason why people are living a lot longer these days, it's basically public health. And so I thought I'd jot down a handful of the, th the interventions over the last 100 years that have really made the biggest difference. Um, so let me start with recognition of tobacco as a health hazard. So if you think back, um, Back in the 19, I wasn't around in 1919, but up until really the 50s and even the 60s when the Surgeon General report came out, you know, you could look at old movies and stuff, and there's, you know, doctors are smoking in the movie, and, and in fact, doctors used to, and some of you may remember this, uh, I think my mom, who's right here, um, mentioned that her doctor, they'd had an ashtray, in the, you know, in the, in the pediatrician's office, um, and so... Recognizing tobacco as a public health hazard and investing public dollars in tobacco control, tobacco messaging, and public policies like smoke-free uh, like smoke -free workplaces, like the Smoke-Free Arizona Act, um, social marketing to get kids off of tobacco, um, working it through the entire uh, health care system. Those interventions have had a huge impact, but it's, 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 it's still an under- recognized um, public health hazard. And it remains today the number one preventable cause of death is tobacco. And tobacco rates, are uh, the, the smoking rate has, has been going down a lot. I think in Arizona, um, the, the smoking rate is around, for adults, 15%, something like that. But it's not, uh, but it's not even across the board. If you look at the number one driver for smoking rate, income. Low income people smoke at a much higher rate uh, th than higher income folks. In fact, if you look at the smoking rate for people that, for families that make over $75,000 a year, the smoking rate's about 5%. If you look at the Medicaid population, it's closer to almost 30%. So when, when Roxanne, when we were at the health department, there's, a, there's some tobacco taxes, but we, what we did is refocus all of our public health messaging on lower income demographic groups because those are the folks that need the resources to quit, need the messaging, and so forth. So 
to recognizing tobacco control has been a huge um, part of increasing life expectancy. We still have a long way to go in that regard, though. Um, another one that's had a tremendous impact on life expectancy and quality of life is family planning. So if you think back 100 years, people would have um, many, many kids. Before family planning was around, people would have six, seven, eight kids. And what that did was do two things. It put additional pressure on those families, financial pressure, because income is the number one driver of health outcomes, by the way. Um, so the more kids you have, in, unless you were on a farm, uh, the more resources were going out the door and the less you could invest per child. That's one thing. The other thing about uh, the lack of, when, when you have a lack of family planning, is that the, the birth spacing becomes shorter and shorter. And it makes it more challenging to accomplish what we call perinatal health. And that is, to, one of the things that you, we do in, in family planning is try to get options out there so that kids can space their kids wider apart, and that allows moms to become healthier before the next pregnancy. And that makes a better outcome in terms of maternal mortality and morbidity, but also it helps the birth outcome for the child because if the spacing is better, it, the child is more likely to have a good outcome and, and be healthier. So family planning as a public health intervention has had a tremendous impact on uh, quality of life and life expectancy. Um, safer and healthier foods, that's a public health intervention really at the community level where um, we've set up public policy around food safety inspections, food quality, regulations from the FDA and USDA, and that rolling down to the state and county level where there's restaurant inspections and so forth like that. Another huge thing uh, as, as an intervention in those days was really um, commercial products, and that is that when refrigeration became affordable for families, they could refrigerate their food, and that made uh, infectious uh, uh, foodborne illnesses much less common because people had an easy way of keeping foods um, cooler so that they didn't have infectious, uh, excuse me, foodborne outbreaks in the home or in, or in places like this, at potlucks and so forth. Um, safer workplaces. So think about what workplaces were like a hundred years ago. Um, and. Uh, Often I hear, I've, I can't tell you how many times I've heard negative comments about OSHA. <laughs> I hear it all, I, I used to, Dad, your, your brother was the worst at it. He, my dad's over there too. He had a brother that used to complain about OSHA all the time. But if you look at, in terms of public policy, who's had a huge impact on improving life expectancy? It's workplace regulations. Um, workplaces back 100 years ago had essentially no um, workplace regulations, and workers were considered basically expendable. Um, the union movement um, was a big part of uh, building more uh, regulations in place to get safer workplaces. It was included in contracts, but also public policy started to develop around improving um, and, and having a better managed workplace safety system. And so uh, workplace safety has had a tremendous impact. Um, another, another public health intervention that's made a big difference is just housing regulations. So house, uh, regulations around um, rental homes, the landlord-tenant acts across the U.S., um, all of those pieces uh, really had a, a big impact on public health. In fact, when you look at what was the key element to getting rid of tuberculosis, by the way, back 100 years ago, tuberculosis was all over the place. I mean, it was a really common um, infectious disease. And it wasn't medication, although medication has been a, an important part of tuberculosis control. The bigger impact was really housing regulations because the reason that TB, TB tuberculosis spread so easily 100 years ago was because the housing regulations, especially in the urban areas, were so unregulated and people were so crowded. Family planning was part of that too, right? Because if you've got too many, if you've got a lot of kids in a small place, it makes it real easy for one person in that household or within that apartment block to have tuber active tuberculosis and spread it to others um, within, uh, with, with, you know, within the, the complex. So housing regulations are really 
I think of them as a, as a real public health benefit um, and was a key element in, in keeping people healthier. Motor vehicle safety is another one. Um, so injuries and accidents, even today, remain the number one killer of all people less than 45 years old. Injuries and accidents. For little kids, it's uh, accidents in the home, um, shelves falling on kids, um, uh, kids getting shocked. There's a lot of hazards within the home, um, and that causes uh, um, injury mortality among uh, uh, kids. Uh, for adults, it's um, mostly uh, motor vehicle accidents, um, but increasingly things like firearms, which would be um, homicide and suicide. And the opioid epidemic that we're in the middle of now is really, in, in public health, we classify that as, as, as uh, injuries. So they're poisonings, but really they're injuries from a medication or a drug. And so uh, increasingly that is a factor um, in, um, in, in injuries that we see. And in fact, it's what the CDC attributes to um, the slight decreases in life expectancy that we've been seeing over the last three years. So for, for essentially the last 100 years, life expectancy has been improving every single year. Like I said, mostly because of public health interventions. Medical technology is a piece of that. Um, but because of the opioid epidemic, um, we're now, over the last two and a half or three years, we've seen that life expectancy in the U.S. is actually decreasing, and that's directly attributable to what we see with the opioid epidemic. And finally, um, one of the things I want to focus on, and we have a later discussion about it, is the number one public health intervention over the last hundred years is what? Vaccinations. Vaccinations. Um, so if you look back a hundred years ago, um, you could re read any kind of literature book from back in those days, and um, you'll see people that were dying in large numbers from things like diphtheria, which we don't have anymore. Um, uh, measles, which uh, is extremely contagious, um, was really common. In fact, before on the drive over here, my mom was talking about how I was born in 1960. The measles vaccine came in 1962. And so I got measles right before the vaccination came. And so my sisters that were born after me were vaccinated for measles and never got it. But um, a potentially very serious disease, mumps, rubella, I mean, the list goes on and on, Hib, um, Haemophilus B influenza. So there's this really long list. Grandma, can you portion control Luke's? He wouldn't got another donut. Maybe you could cut it in half for him. Portion control is a public health thing too. Um, so, so immunizations, vaccinations, the number one thing in terms of increasing life expectancy over the last um, 100 years. Super important, um, but one of the things and one of the challenges that we're having here in Arizona, but it's across really the whole country, is because Families don't have experience with vaccine preventable diseases in terms of now it's been so many years, like since the 60s when the MMR vaccine and so forth came out. There's a lot of people who don't remember what those illnesses were like and how um, serious they were and how scared people were of those, um, of those diseases. And so there's more and more folks that are choosing to not vaccinate their kids. And what that causes is a lack of what we call herd immunity. And what herd immunity is, and I've been trying to focus this, because there's some public policy debate that we'll get to in a second out the state legislature. Um, the, 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 the concept of herd immunity is this, that the vaccine that I get, yes, it protects me, but the real value of that vaccine is that it protects the rest of the community. And the reason that having and, and so for that reason, um, you have to have, well, let me say this. The reason you need to have a high vaccination rate above 95% is because to, of two things. Number one, if we vaccinate everybody in this room for say MMR, and you have the whole series of three vaccines, um, there's gonna be about probably five to six of you that won't form a robust antibody titer to that vaccine 
And so therefore, even though you've been vaccinated, you're still susceptible to measles because everyone's immune system reacts a little bit differently. So because vaccines aren't 100% effective, you need to have close to 100% coverage because if you vaccinate 100 people, only 95 of them or so are gonna form an antibody titer to protect that individual person. And if your vaccination rates go below, say for measles, uh, 94 or 95%, what that means is you'll have 10% of the population susceptible. And then when somebody comes back from Europe, which measles is all over the place in Europe right now, um, so a European traveler or someone comes back from Europe, gets measles and goes into a community if they go into a community with a 95% vaccination rate, that virus isn't gonna be able to find, it's highly unlikely the vaccine or that virus is gonna find somebody to infect. Um, and they would get sick. So if, it, but if your vaccination rates are low, below 95%, then the virus is gonna find somebody. And that person is gonna get measles. And it might be someone who was already vaccinated. And they are gonna spread it to another person. And so um, the only way to, to, uh, to protect the community is to have vaccination rates above 95%. There are another, so there's, there's a couple other reasons for the importance of herd immunity. One is um, special needs people. There's many people who, uh, with special needs who have less robust immune systems and therefore don't form the antibody titer. And the way that we protect special needs folks is to get the rest of the community vaccinated. And the third population is kids under two because the, for example, the MMR vaccine, you don't start that till um, 24 months. So kids between zero and two haven't been vaccinated because the, the vaccine isn't administered until two. The way you keep little babies healthy is by having everybody vaccinated. And the challenge that we're having um, now is that more and more people are deciding not to vaccinate their kids. I think in part because they don't have personal experience with stories or haven't seen um, diseases like measles and mumps and, and, and rubella, and, uh, hib and so forth. Um, so, so, so what does it look like in Arizona? Um, right now, if you look at Arizona as a state, our vaccination rates are about 94, 95%. Those are people that vaccinated. It doesn't mean all those people are, have immunity, but it means that's where we are in terms of coverage. But it's not evenly distributed. And so what we see is that, um, and in some ways it's counterintuitive, that families with high incomes, with a high credentials in terms of education, those are the families that in, are the ones choosing not to vaccinate their kids. And so if you look across the state, if you, it's a pretty good marker. If you look at the income in a zip code, that's a pretty, you can have a pretty good indicator of what the vaccination rates are in that zip code. So um, one of the highest, in, the highest income zip codes in the state is up around Sedona. That's also the community with, I think they still have the lowest vaccination rates. Um, same thing, there's parts of Yavapai County with very low vaccination rates. Uh, Coconino County has pockets, high income pockets, high income zip codes um, with, with low vaccination rates. Another, another places where we see low vaccination rates are in charter schools. So if you look at public schools, the, the, the vaccination, especially public schools in lower income, the vaccination rates are really high. Where you see lower vaccination rates are high income zip codes and especially charter schools. There's a bunch of charter schools, which are public schools, by the way, they use public dollars. Um, there's a lot, a lot of public schools with vaccination rates in the 80s. And um, we, back when I was at the health department, we started posting school by school all the vaccination rates at, all the, at the schools. And they still have that, I think, post up on the website. So you can go and look at an individual school and look at the vaccination rates. Um, so um, it's, a real it's a tough nut to crack to try to get um, immunization rates up. But one of the main tools that we have um, is mandatory vaccination for, for, uh, for entry into elementary school. So it starts in, pre there are some requirements for preschool, 
then there's requirements from kindergarten and sixth grade. And um, uh, m m most states, well, every state has medical exemptions from school. Well, every state has school vaccination requirements. Um, Every, all, every state also has exemptions from those requirements for uh, medical exemptions. So those are people who can't get vaccinated because of a medical condition, and that makes sense. Um, and uh, there are, I think, 19 states like Arizona where there's an exemption from the school vaccine requirements that's called a personal exemption, which just means I don't want to do it. Um, and so what we tried to do when Roxanne and I were in the health department was we can't change the state law, but we made the forms, the exemption forms, a lot more specific. The old exemption form for the personal exemption used to be basically, I want to exempt my kid from the vaccine. You turn that into the school administrator and the kid gets to attend school even though they haven't been vaccinated. So we changed the form to make it so that it was uh, kind of like the rental contract, you know, when you rent a car or something like that, where you have, a, you have to initial line by line. And so I understand that measles is a communicable disease that puts both my kids at risk and puts other children in my child's classroom at risk for the following things. And then the, the you know, the, the, the results from that disease. They have to initial each of those and then they had something at the end where they had to sign. I understand that by not vaccinating my kid, I am both putting my child at risk and his or her classmates. And so that was the, that was the form that we started using, hoping that that would make a difference and start lowering the number of personal exemptions that we saw. And maybe it had some effect, but the continuing trend is to lose a half a percent of vaccination rates per year, which doesn't sound like a lot, but if you take two and if let's take you take five years, you're going to lose two and a half percent over ten years. If the trend continued, you used lose five percent per year. And so one of our goals. Let me look at the time. Yeah. Um, when, when's it over? A half hour. Okay, because I want to get to the bills. Um, uh, so which, which so one of our goals this year in the Public Health Association was to try to get some bills in place to help reverse this trend. And we do have some Democratic sponsors of some bills that would do good. They never, most of them never got assigned to a committee. And the one that did get signed to a committee not, never got a hearing. And so we were never able to make any progress. But the disturbing thing is that um, there's three bills uh, that were sponsored by Nancy Bartow, a, 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 a legislator in North Phoenix, She's in the House of Representatives, and Paul Boyer, also a senator, um, that would all go the other direction. And one of the bills um, would, so like I said, there's a medical exemption, which makes sense. There's in place a personal exemption, which is problematic because it's so easy to get out of the school, the public school vaccination requirements. But the, the third bill, but this bill would add a religious exemption. Um, and I was at the testimony, and it was in the Senate last week, in the Senate uh, Education Committee, and then in the House Health Committee. Um, and, well, you can go look at it for yourself, but it was person after person. Well, first of all, um, Representative Bartow gave a two hour block right at the beginning of the committee hearing between 8 and 10 o'clock for all the anti, for anti-vaccine present, presenters. And then um, had everyone was limited to one minute after that. So we had a whole series of physicians that went up and gave, um, uh, gave their rationale for why it's important to have herd immunity, why adding a religious exemption would in continue to erode vaccination rates, and why that is bad for public health, community health, and individual health. Um, in the end, both of the, that bill was passed out of committee five to four, It'll be going, I'm sure Representative Bowers, who's the Speaker of the House, will put it on the floor um, for a vote this week. Um, because the House is split 31-29, which is much closer in terms of party affiliation, uh, because it's a, a lot closer than it has been in years past, I think there's a chance that we can defeat this on the um, 
this week, but it's going to take turning somebody like Representative Cobb or um, I don't know who, uh, uh, Wanniger maybe. You have to look for the moderates. <laughs> Um, it, Representative Cobb's a dentist, so she's had some medical training and understands the importance of vaccines. So I'm going to focus my efforts on Representative Cobb to try to get that to not pass on the floor. Um, yeah. Well, she's in the Senate, so she's our wild. Yeah. So I'm, we're still. I'm trying to stop it in the House before it gets over to the Senate because Brophy McGee in the Senate. So there was a bill in the Senate, the Boyer bill, which would have in the Senate, which would have added a exemption was in uh, the Senate Education Committee and and it, so there's eight members of that committee five to three split and Representative Brophy or Senator Brophy McGee voted with the Democrats so it was a four to four tie in the Senate so we stopped that bill in the Senate last week bills passed their committee they go to the floor if they get 31 votes that'll be coming back to the Senate and then our strategy is with Carter and Brophy McGee those are two moderate Republicans in the Senate that both get the fact of how important vaccines are and how public policy decisions like this hurt vaccination rates and why that's bad. They both get it. So I think if it gets out of the House and ends up over in the Senate, we can still um, stop it in the Senate. And, um, you know, and b because that's a 17 13 split, if you turn two, then, and all the Democrats hold fast, then it's 15-15 and that's not a pass. You've got to have a majority. Even, if, let's say two people are absent, if it was 15-13, that doesn't pass either. You have to have 16. Um, you, you have to have a majority of the number of men, not just a majority of who's there that day to get something to pass. Um, there's a couple of other bills. I, I mentioned the religious exemption, but there's a, a couple of other anti-vax bills, one of which would require physicians to, when uh, parents are in the doctor's office before the vaccines are given, right now, uh, the families get like a two-page um, document from the CDC that describes um, like the, the real stuff that families need to know about the vaccines, like what are the, why is it important, what are the side effects, if you do have a side effect, what should you do, uh, that kind of information on a CDC form, that families get that now. What this bill would do would be to make the physician give and have a conversation with the manufacturers, um, it, the, 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 like the FDA form, it's like a 15 page form for each vaccine and give the family that form and it talks about the media that it's grown on and all this kind of stuff. And so my objection to that, which I talked about in the media was, number one, it it's, can confuse families, but I think even more important than that is that it can hijack the pediatric appointment. So those of you that remember your pediatric appointments or you take your grandkids in, and, or, in or if your own kids, you, I mean, those pediatric appointments are like a half hour long and they are just completely crowded with developmental screens and talking about home safety and nutrition conversations and talking about car seats. And there's so many things that have to happen in that pediatric appointment. And now you're gonna add a 15 to 16 page form that you get, that's gonna spark a conversation with the parent. And it's just, you know, I just don't see the point for it. Yeah. Where does the governor stand on this? He could veto something like this. Is he watching the news? Well, so what the governor has said publicly is all I know, because I worked for him for about a month and a half. Yeah, can you repeat the question? Oh, yeah. Um, so the question was, uh, yeah, thanks for reminding me of that. So the question was, um, where does the governor stand? And um, I'll leave out the editorial comment. But <laughs> um, so the pub publicly, what the governor said is he's pro-vaccination. But if you look at, and maybe, and maybe he is. I, I, don't, I, I don't know him that well. But it, one of the things that, and some of you I know know about the asledge.gov website where you can actually go read the bills and sign in. Um, if you look at these three bills that I would call anti-vax bills, and you look, one of the things I look for is what, what are the state agencies saying? In other words, when I was at the health department, when we would see, well, I work for Brewer, let us do this. I don't know if Ducey lets the agencies do this, but when we would see bills that would be bad for vaccinations, I would direct our lobbyists to sign up against the bill, and then you could see the State Department of Health Services was against the bill. 
Um, if you look at these three bills, DHS isn't there at all. ADHS has not signed in against or even neutral on the bill. So, um, at, so while the governor's statements have been pro-vaccine, the behavior of the agency, at least at this point, doesn't suggest that at least they're, they're concerned enough to put their agency in a p opposition. So, but if it were somehow to get through the Senate, these anti-vax bills, then um, of course, Ducey would have the opportunity to veto it. And maybe he would, I, I just don't know him well enough. Um, so, with the time I have left, I thought what we would do, unless there's any more questions, is go through some of the bills that are out there in terms of public health, and I'll talk just a little bit about it. We can't get into a lot of detail, but I'll give you a, a snapshot of where we are. Yeah, so the question is, are there some public health interventions out there to talk to parents about the importance of vaccines? Um, I would just, let me just answer that question by saying, the number one public health intervention would be to get rid of the personal exemption. And that's what happened in California. So um, California, like Arizona, had lots of very high income zip codes with really low vaccination rates. and. Um, there was a case of measles in Disneyland in January of 2015, and it was a, caused a widespread outbreak in California. Um, and we actually had a Disneyland case here, in, but fortunately the people came back to Kearney, which has really high vaccination rates, and so we didn't have a big outbreak. Um, there were a couple cases that went into Pinal County, but we never had the big outbreak from Disneyland. But there was a big outbreak in California because of the, that came out of Disneyland. And California, like Arizona, had uh, both a medical exemption, which is appropriate, and they had a personal exemption, which means I don't want to vaccinate my kid, but I'm still going to send them to school kind of thing. And California got rid of their personal exemption, and the vaccination rates went from a California average of 94% to like 98%. And in those high income zip codes like Marin County, which was the, which was the worst, those vaccination rates went way up. So in my opinion, the main intervention is to get rid of the personal exemption, and the rationale is that you're sending your kids to a public school. These are public dollars. We have a public interest in ensuring high vaccination rates. So if you're going to send your kid to a public school, we're gonna ask that unless there's a medical exemption, that they be vaccinated. So that's really the intervention. Conversations within pediatric offices might work, but there's so much misinformation on the internet these days that that is part of the struggle that we have. Facebook groups, that kind of stuff, spread misinformation and spread this interest in not vaccinating. We had a question back here first. So the question is, why is measles all over Europe? It's two things. Number one, it's the same thing we've been talking about, which is parents choosing not to vaccinate their kids, as is the case here. In, in the US, there's school vaccine requirements, but there's exemptions, same as there are here in, in, um, in Europe. And the, and the reason it's measles is because of all of the vaccine preventable uh, viruses and bacteria, measles is the most communicable. And so the reason you see it's kind of like uh, the sentinel, when you start having a drift in your vaccination rates, the first thing you see are measles outbreaks. And so Western Europe, it's all over the place. And it's surprising which countries have really low vaccination rates. Switzerland, which when I was there, no one even crossed an empty sidewalk, like there's maybe a red light and no cars anywhere and they will stand there and not cross against the red. You know, but their vaccination rates are in the 70% range. Same thing in Italy. The Five Star Movement, which is the, the coalition government in Italy, one of their, one of their platforms was anti-vax. It was two things, anti-immigration and anti-vaccination. And they're in charge of the coalition government. So Italy has bad vaccination rates. So it's a combination of bad vaccination rates and the fact that measles is so communicable. In fact, if, um, if, if one of you had measles actually clinical measles and we all left 
and somebody came in at uh, 3 o'clock uh, to clean the place, the, that person could still get infected. It's so communicable that it can be two hours later in an elevator. Um, it, it's just it's super communicable, so that's why measles. Uh, question here. Oh, wait, right over here, yeah. Yeah, um, it's, it's always seemed to me that pediatricians are the ones that generally direct parents what shots the children need and all that sort of thing. Are there pediatricians out there? What's happening with the pediatricians? Are they not recommending this, or are there some who are not recommending it to the parents? Yeah, so I won't repeat because you had a microphone. So um, good question. So pediatricians are not the problem. I mean, uh, by and large, pediatricians, they totally understand the importance of the communicable diseases and vaccinations. And in fact, there's a lot of pediatric practices that will, before you even have your kid, you come in for an appointment and they tell you, look, we are a vaccinating practice and that's a condition under which we expect, if you're going to get care here, these are the expectations that we have in our partnership together um, for your kids. So it's not the pediatricians, it's the people that choose to take their kid, A, or don't, aren't getting, um, aren't taking their kids to pediatricians or are paying for, say, to go to a naturopath. And by the way, many naturopaths agree with vaccination. Not all of them. Um, some, of the, some parents bring their kids to chiropractors and some chiropractors believe in vaccinations and some don't. So I think a lot of it has to do with families, parents choosing to take their kids to clinicians that may not have the same commitment, but the problem is not with pediatricians. Yes, my understanding is that uh, parents were afraid that their children were gonna get autism from the vaccinations. Now, my feeling is that if the vaccinations were given separately instead of three at a time, that would give the body time to adjust to each one of the toxins that you were trying to introduce and give the child, their body, time, even if it was only a week, to adjust to a new whatever it is. Yeah, so, um, so I'll start with the, the autism thing and then I'll uh, go to the other, the, your other thing, which it, there's a point to that. So um, there's been ton, many, many, many studies that have been done over and over again that have established there's no link between vaccinations and autism. Um, you can believe that if you're not, but I mean, I'm telling you, I've read the studies and they're very robust, huge N numbers in terms of very, very statistically significant. But I do think that one of, one of the things you just mentioned is a, one of the reasons why we see declines in the vaccination rates. And that is that, it, like, I'll give you an example. I think the 18 month appointment has four and maybe even five vaccines in it. And so, um, and so to be a parent, and I was, I remember Luke <laughs> going in those appointments and it's like the needles are lined up, you know, and, and they cry every time. And it's like, it's, uh, those are hard appointments. And so um, my opinion is that the solution, and there is efforts underway for this, one of the solutions is these multi-antigen vaccines, and there's more and more of them now, where you take a single vaccine that would cover, say, a multi-recombinant, so you might be six antigens included in that vaccine, and that reduces the sheer number of, it, of, of, of injections, which would help to, at least on the margins, um, some, alleviate some of the resistance that we see among some parents. So there, there is effort, there are efforts underway to get those number of shots down. Um, Oh. Like, you know, all of the, 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 the immune response to the antigens. Um, well, I mean, I guess you could look at it uh, um, in a couple of different ways. One would be, then the answer would be to have more appointments where all that you would have was a vaccine on the interim periods. Um, Another is to just make some decisions and say, we're not gonna add any more vaccines to the school required shots. Oh, no, but, but, but you do have a point in that over the course of time, we've added more and more 
in, we've added more and more vaccines to the school required list. And so when I was in that health director job, um, well, actually it was during the Napolitano administration, it was a, I wasn't the agency director yet, but we added uh, chicken pox to the, to the required list. And one of the things we thought about before adding it to the list is what you brought about, which is it's everything, every public policy decisions like this are on a scale. Like it's not, it's not all, there's, there's, con, there's, there's, you have to consider all pieces when you make it a public policy decision. And so um, when you add a school required vaccine, then you're adding a requirement for what you just described for an additional vaccine. So that's something you need to consider. That vaccine has a cost, and so that's another thing you need to consider. The, the, uh, this was pre-Affordable Care Act, and so not everybody had access to health insurance at the time, and so you're adding a financial burden for somebody who may not have health insurance. Um, so, ACIP, yeah, the CDC has a group called ACIP which makes the recommendations. But uh, we still have a little bit of time, and we'll, I want to move on to some of these other bills because there's some interesting stuff. Yeah. I'm just curious, is there any effort to uh, give vaccinations at the school so you don't have to necessarily have a pediatric appoint, you know, appointment to get the vaccines? Um, so, the, uh, so there's no efforts to do that at the school. The way it has been working is county health departments will set up uh, school vaccination clinics um, at malls and so forth and, and, and help to fill in those gaps uh, for families that, uh, where the kids are behind. But, but, the, but back, I can remember, and I'm probably, many of, some of you remember, going into the school cafeteria and there would be like, it seemed like there were six nurses on both sides, it was less than that. And you'd walk through and they'd, they had these guns. And they were, in, they were needle, they, they were using high pressure instead of needles. And you'd get like six shots as you walked through the cafeteria. So when, when the mass vaccination programs first started in the 60s, that's how it did work. They were doing them in the cafeteria um, and vaccinating kids at school. But today, it's uh, more decentralized. Another option that has been gaining traction to get it more, to, to remove some barriers to vaccination is to increase the scope of practice for um, pharmacists to be able to, to get vaccines. So now you can go to say CVS or uh, Walgreens if you wanna sh get shingles. By the way, if you haven't, if you're over 50, um, there's a new, va Sing shingles used to be a, a 60 and up shot. Now there's a vaccine for 50 and up, which I still need to go get, which I haven't done yet. <laughs> well, I'm on the waiting list for it. <laughs> now, I went to Walgreens and I'm on the waiting list. Um, I forgot where I was going with that, but anyway, any other questions? And I want to move on to some of these other bills. You mentioned that high income areas are where the lowest vaccination rates occur. Do you have any idea what the reason for that would be? So uh, we did some focus groups back in 2013. We hired the College of Public Health down in Tucson um, to do focus groups with families and um, it, uh, the, the answer across the board, part of the answers that we got were what you were describing, which is that there's so many vaccines that are happening during the pediatric appointments that some parents were just saying, we're, I'm not against vaccines, but I'm against having so many vaccines. And so kids would fall behind. They weren't unimmunized, but were under immunized. There's a difference. Um, uh, so that's one part of the answer. And another part was just stuff that they read on the internet and anti-vax groups and so forth. So social media was part of the answers that they gave. And autism and what, what Some of them. Online and so the question was, what were they finding online that scares them? Um, part of it was the misinformation about autism, um, the number of vaccines, just it's, uh, um, mercury poisoning. Something they read in a herbal health journal or something. I mean, lots of different reasons. Um, but, but, it's, but I've always been a believer in if you've got a public policy intervention that can get you past all of the labor-intensive conversations, 
that that is probably the best approach. And that's why I've been an advocate over the last couple of years for getting rid of the personal exam. Um, if you're going to send your kid to public school, because it, again, it's tied to a public interest in the public dollars that we're investing in the education. Yeah. Does public health not concern itself with mental health? Uh, for example, teaching emotional intelligence? Yeah. So, uh, good question. Does public health concern itself with mental health? Um, y yes. If public health is, mental health is part of public health. And um, uh, the, the interventions are different, obviously. Um, one of the biggest public health challenges we have, and it's really an epidemic, is with suicide, which is tied to depression, anxiety, and et cetera. Um, um, and so it's important, emotional intelligence is, by the way, we always, when I was at the health department, we always did emotional intelligence because it improves the behavior in any system if you can have everybody understanding emotional intelligence. But, um, uh, but, but obviously it's, it's part of public health, the interventions are different. Um, I, I will tell a, a quick, I'll tell a quick story that's, uh, about a public health intervention in the UK around suicide. Um, is that it? <laughs> I, won't, I don't have time for that story, but because I want to get to some of these other things because it's contemporary. Um, so, we hear, we okay. Um, so, <laughs> so in the U.S., um, one of the biggest cause, one of the the mechanism for suicide is often firearms, especially for men. Um, in the U.K., they don't have the Second Amendment gun laws, and or they don't have. You can't just go in and buy guns, and so there's not so many guns all. Around. And so in the UK, um, the, uh, the the mechanism of suicide tended to be over uh, uh, poisoning with ibuprofen, and so people would take like many many ibuprofens, and that's how people were killing themselves, young people in in the UK. And the national health system there, national um, health system, did a study on. And looking for a public health intervention to at least stall the suicide, not get to the root cause, but this intervention is around how do you eliminate, how do you, what intervention can you implement to interfere with that act? And one of the things that about suicide is that the time period between suicide ideation and then carrying out a suicide is really important. And with young people, that can be a really short period of time between the time they think they decide I'm going to kill myself and actually doing it. And if you're using a firearm, it's instantaneous and there's no chance to change your mind. But with ibuprofen, you, if, in, if you take a bunch of pills, then that works pretty fast too. So what the National Health Service did was implement a uh, countrywide ban on ibuprofen in the big jars. And they said everything has to be in a blister pack. And so the, the difference, the time period between suicide ideation and carrying that out, it took so long to punch the things, the ibuprofen out of the blister pack that it had a dramatic decrease in young people's suicide through that intervention of just extending the time period, you know? So that just reminded me of that story, and it's published. So, um, all right, so let me, let me talk about some of the things that we're working towards down at the legislature and the reason why we think it's important for public health. Um, number one is uh, we're working on getting uh, pregnant, medic everyone knows Medicaid is, the health ins is access health insurance for low-income people. Um, uh, women don't have any coverage for oral health. Pregnant women don't, well, adults have emergency dental, but pregnant women don't have any access to perinatal care or excuse me, um, periodontal care and oral health cleanings and so forth. And there's a direct link between birth outcomes and periodontal disease. And so we're, at, we're working on a bill, this is our fourth year on it, I think we're gonna get through this year to get comprehensive oral health coverage. We're just, just for pregnant women. Because ultimately our goal is for everybody, but if we just focus on pregnant women this year, maybe we can expand it in future years. So, um, so that's one of our big efforts. And uh, I think we can get both Brophy McGee and Carter on board, along with all the Democrats. And I think this is the year that we're gonna actually be able to get 
comprehensive oral health coverage into the Medi state Medicaid program. So that's, uh, that's Senate Bill 1088. Another interesting one is uh, decriminalize, de decriminalizing syringe services program. So um, I thought that would be an interesting one to bring up in this group. So in Arizona, um, to, if you, so one, let me start by saying syringe access services, I've heard of it as called needle exchange, but that's a, too simple of a word for what syringe services is. So that's for someone who's an injection drug user, and you have a program in which a, a, a social worker has clean syringes that they can offer to the injection drug user without questions and without judgment. And if you have a program like that, it A, slows the spread of bloodborne pathogens, and that's well documented in literature, but also that social worker is the most likely person to be able to form a relationship with the injection drug users to get them into treatment and show them what the treatment options are because they've formed a relationship. And so by the time they have five interactions with the in injection drug user, that's the point at which be more successful in terms of the person into a treatment program. Um, sadly, in Arizona, it's a class six felony to run a treatment program like that. And in my opinion, and what it is, is that the state law makes it a class six felony to give a, to have needle exchange, which is the key part of the, it's a key part of the syringe services program. Um, and I think it's because some prosecutors and Sheila Polk up in Yavapai County signed up against the bill. Um, I think that some of them believe that, that these felonies are performance measures. That's just an editorial comment on my part. Um, and they want to keep it a class six felony. Um, if we can decriminalize needle exchange and take it off the felony list, then nonprofits like the uh, Sonoran Prevention Works, um, Coconino County Public Health, Pima County Public Health, they could all start actually implementing syringe services programs so that they could really get a better handle, form a relationship with injection drug users, slow the spread of, of, uh, of bloodborne pathogens, and at the same time, better engage injection drug users and treatment options. And so but that's never going to happen until we get the felony off the books. Because, I mean, you're going to fill out a grant and say, we're going to commit felonies all day long. It's hard to get grant money. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> right, I, I mean, we're, it's, I live in the world of like practical reality. <laughs> yeah, well I would, probably a voter initiative, and you may, uh, there's, at least for marijuana, it's going to be on the, uh, the ballot again in, uh, in a couple of years. So we're trying to uh, decriminalize syringe services programs. Um, I won't go into too much detail about, but the kids care program, those of you are familiar with kids care, it's, so our Medicaid access program goes from uh, up to 138% of federal poverty, and the kids care program is a buy-in Medicaid health insurance if their income is between 138 and 250% of poverty. Um, that program, while it exists today in Arizona, get a reauthorization bill this year, kids care would go away and those families would lose the option. So that's something that we're, um, that we're working on. And I think there's, I believe there's enough bipartisan support on that bill to get it through. Um, texting and driving is another important public health uh, bill that's, that's up this year. Up until now, there's been Steve Farley, who's Senator Farley was from down in Tucson, has been the champion for the hand-free driving uh, laws. And his stuff would get maybe one hearing, never got out of the Senate. Um, I think this is the year where we're going to actually see a bill come out um, that requires free driving and, and no texting. I say that for two reasons. Um, more and more cities are actually implementing um, hands-free laws, like Glendale has one, the Indian Reservation has one. Phoenix does not. Tucson does. So depending on where you drive, there's, there are hands-free laws out there. Um, uh, so now that's the work of jurisdictions that have a law. But as with often the case in the legislature, it, it sometimes takes a some kind of an event to wake them up. 
And this year it was, there was a law enforcement officer out in, on Pima Road that got hit by a driver who admitted that he was texting. And now the family members of that law enforcement person are down at the legislature with pictures of him and stuff. And now all the bills are sponsored by Republicans this year, which they never used to be. And they're all getting hearings. Um, and my, my, I, there, so there's four different um, texting and driving bills. The one that I suggest that you support is McGee bill, because it's the most comprehensive, um, is 1247, no, that's 1165. Um, uh, and, and so uh, it's, it's an element to changing driving behavior, but having a hands-free law isn't going to change everyone's behavior. It's going to take continuing messaging, it's continued you know, efforts to get people to understand that, you know, that texting and driving is the same thing as, in, I call it, when I do radio and TV and stuff, I call it, it, really, it's impaired driving, just like alcohol. For the time that you're texting, it's actually your. I saw a study once where it, you know you're. It's like having a blood alcohol content of like 0.15 or something. So, but then, of course, when you can refocus right away, unlike with alcohol. But um, a big problem causes lots of injuries and accidents. Um, and the the other good thing about 1165 is that it's a proactive. That it's not that it's not just secondary enforcement, because the Farley bills from last year were all secondary enforcement as a practical, just to try to get it through. Ch secondary just means if you can't, it, it, that the law enforcement have to, you'd have to go through a, 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 let's say a stop sign, and then they could tack on the texting and driving. But the 1165 bill makes it so that if law enforcement sees you te with a phone in your hand, that is enough to pull you over right there. It's called primary enforcement. So. Um, 1165 is that bill, yeah. Uh, quick question, how do we find this list that you're presenting us today to be able to follow up and read on other than just going to the full list of legislation yeah. specific for public service? Yeah, so good question. The question is, uh, how can, where can we go to find out where these bills are? So I have a good answer. Um, so uh, my blog. So it's on azpha.org. So it's the Arizona Public Health Association, azpha.org. And if you go into the corner, it, it's called uh, Public Health Today. That's my blog. And then as soon as I get home, in fact, I'm going to post a new one with all this stuff. And I, I, I whittle down the list of like 1,000 bills to about 35 that we're tracking, following, and advocating for, and a few that we're advocating against, like the anti-vax laws. So, um, and I post a new one every uh, Sunday is when I put up the new. Can you post another one on Facebook page too? Or there's a link to your Facebook Oh, a link to the blog. Oh, I need to get it. Is there a link to your Facebook or maybe on our website? Where's our website? There's a link as well. Okay. So anyway, I have a few more, but I know I'm out of time. Um, are there any other questions? Yeah. Earlier in, okay, earlier in your presentation, you had mentioned that uh, public health has been the primary driver in increasing life expectancy in the U.S., and you cited a number of different specific uh, health policy uh, developments that have increased life expectancy in the U.S. Uh, the last few years, though, life expectancy in the U.S. has been going down, uh, from what I've read, and so um, I'm curious why we're seeing a reversal in life expectancy in the U.S. What are the factors uh, contributing to it? Yeah, uh, so th the question is why has the trend towards uh, increased life expectancy turned around in the last couple of years? Two main things. Um, uh, most things are getting better over time, but the which worse are A, poisonings from opioids, which means, and, 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 and by the way, there, if you look at opioids generally, you have prescription drugs and then heroin and fentanyl. And what, in, 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 Many states, there's effective public health intervention around prescribing practices, and now Arizona has a better law on prescribing practices, pills part of it. And so poisonings from opioid pills is decreasing, not sharply, but it's decreasing over time. But that's overshadowed by the sharp increase that you see from fentanyl and heroin. And one of the challenges with your brain becomes addicted to the to the opioid, and then you need to 
clinical care to wean yourself off of those levels of opioids that you're taking. But one of the challenges that people face is that um, either they don't go through that process or their doctor just cuts them off completely, which sends them into the fentanyl slash heroin camp. And so, um, so that's, so the number, so one thing is this opioid epidemic. I wish I had time to talk about that, and maybe this is a good time to do it. The other piece is suicides in young people. So those are the two components that you see is in a dramatic increase in the number of suicides over the last few years on young people. And, um, well, not just young people, really, middle age as well. And even senior, really all ages, um, especially men. And, um, and the opioid epidemic. And let me just go back and just for a second, since I just have a minute, and how did we get, is this is my opinion of how we got here with the opioid epidemic. Um, this, the story starts back in 1999. There was a convention um, of the Pain Management Society. And uh, so these are uh, pain management docs that have annual conferences. And the, the association president um, had a presidential challenge back in 1999. Um, to the society, and he proposed that pain be listed as the fifth vital sign. So when you go into the doctor, what do they do? They do blood pressure, they do pulse, they do respiration rate and temperature. Those are the four vital signs. They added pain as the fifth vital sign. And so um, during uh, routine, if you go to the hospital, that's, they'll do those things, and then they'll probably ask you, how, are you in any pain? And then for kids, they have a little smiley faces, you know, frowns to smiley faces in the scale for that. Adults have a different scale from one to 10. And so pain became listed as the fifth vital sign. What that did is it initiated first with the VA, the Veterans Administration adopted pain as the fifth vital sign. And so it institutionalized pain and pain management into the infrastructure of the VA. And so physicians and clinicians would be held accountable if they did not aggressively enough manage that patient's pain. And so the incentives became aligned towards over-prescribing or over-treating pain with opioids combined with the fact that the drug manufacturers and Purdue Pharma, et cetera, were falsely telling physicians at, at trainings, et cetera, that the opioids were not addictive, which they knew they were. The next thing that happened was CMS, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, also adopted pain as the fifth vital sign. And if you add up Medicare and Medicaid together, it's a huge part of the healthcare system. And so um, they then began to institutionalize pain as a fifth vital sign through their contracts with their provider networks. And so hospitals and the provider networks then were also held accountable to not managing pain aggressively enough which provided an additional incentive to prescribe opioids, combined with the fact, again, that the drug companies were not fully disclosing the fact that they were addictive. And over the course of about 15 years, um, we've gotten to the point where 5% of the world's population, and we're taking 85% of the world's opioids. I think. So there are. So the question is, are there criminal? No, civil we'll, uh, be charges being question. filed. Do um, I don't. I don't know about the criminal side of it, but there's a multi-jurisdiction. There's a group of attorney generals across the U.S. that are suing the drug companies on behalf of state Medicaid programs for the damages caused in their states. And actually, Bernovich has signed on to the lawsuit in Arizona. So there is. I can answer the civil piece. I don't know about the criminal side. Yeah, so the website is azpha.org. A-Z, Arizona, A-Z-P, Public H Health A Association. And I got a blog up there where I, A-Z-P-H-A. I hate to end it on this okay. note, but we are out of time. And I really appreciate you coming out and it is our custom to mud all of our speakers. Oh, so thank you. Thank you so much. I think we, think we could come back for a week's worth of talks. <laughs> Thanks for the invitation.
All right. Thank you so much. Uh, if you wouldn't mind giving uh, Will another round of applause. That does uh, conclude our Sunday speaker meeting, but we do have another board meeting right after this. If you're n not interested in that, but are interested in going to lunch, please see Richard or myself for directions. We'll be gl glad to guide you in that uh, direction. Also, uh, next Sunday speaker meeting is in two weeks. We are having uh, Bob McWhorter, 